welcome back to Victoria on Relay FM. I'm Quinn Rose, and I didn't go to art school, um, but that doesn't stop me from learning about art. And I'm Betty. I also didn't go to art school, but that also doesn't stop me from learning about art, even though I have no idea what we're learning today so far. <laughs> well, I'm going to start with jumping right into looking at a painting. So I have sent you a link to an image in the show notes. Before we, I tell you what the topic is or anything, um, I just want to hear a little description of this uh, painting from you. I am looking at what appears to be, I want to say a farmhouse in a rural looking landscape. Um, the farmhouse, uh, at least what I, what I think it is, a farmhouse is, looks like it's red, maybe got like w- wood that's like either painted red or it's like a really red like wood. Um, and it has um, like a gray roof. I have no idea what material because it's just like a very, pat- like a patch of gray what is the is the color. Um, anyway, it's surrounded, yeah, by grass and it looks like there might be like roads in the back and, and they're like rolling hills. Then there is a, a light blue sky with some smidges of clouds possibly. Um, and it's painted in, I would say like a loose-ish brushstroke. Like I said, I can't really tell exactly what some of the materials are. There's no distinct detail um but it's also not like crazy impressionist like i can make out the details or i can make out the general shapes on what they are now you're looking at uh, just a little photo of this painting um but do you think that this is a painting that for example like you'd want to keep um in your own possession or maybe this is something you could sell to buy something else like i'm just here, like is wh- what are your overall thoughts about like what you would want ownership of this piece for like as in if I had this piece what I would do with it or would I purchase this piece um if you already if you already owned it uh do you think this is maybe something you would keep or you would want to sell and get something else oh okay um I would say I would probably keep it like I I in general actually quite like landscapes um and and and, you know like um if I already I'm not I don't have a lot of money to buy my own art currently because I am in school even though it's not art school so if I had a painting I would probably display it display it but I guess I would say like it wouldn't be something I would get like it is a little bit I want to say like not that interesting of a topic like I wouldn't if I saw this at a store I probably wouldn't buy it um but if I had it I would be like yeah it's nice Okay, okay. It's a shame you wouldn't buy it because it is going to be on sale for an estimated 8 to $12 million. Well, I mean, I couldn't afford it anyway. <laughs> the exercise I just gave to you is a little bit misleading because it's not about whether an individual person would want to own this painting necessarily. It's about whether an art museum that owns it wants to keep it um, because we're talking about deaccessioning. Oh, this is very interesting. Okay, cool, cool. So this painting is by Edward Hopper, and it's called Cobbs Barnes South Truro. It is currently in possession by the Whitney Museum of American Art. So before I get into more specific details about this and a little bit of the history of deaccessioning, I want to ask, like, do you have um, any pre-existing knowledge about the process of deaccessioning from museums? um, And what are your general thoughts about it, if so? I have heard of deaccessioning as a thing that exists having worked in a museum for many years but because I'm not involved in that or I wasn't involved in that I don't exactly know how it works or who gets to decide or why one would um, uh, and I presume deaccessioning is to get rid of a painting that you own um, in your collection presuming to sell it now you just throw it in the trash. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, unless it's really bad, you're just like, screw this. Do you know if the AGO deaccession did anything while you were there that, like, was prominent? Or was it just all just, like, an administrative thing that was happening in the background that wasn't really involving you? Yeah, I mean, if they did de- decommission anything prominent, I was not aware of it. I- I'm sure it happened, but I've only ever heard about acquisitions. I've only ever, like, because they you know, publicized it or they would display it. But things that went out of the collection, I, I'm trying to think, like, I don't think 
Yeah, I don't think I even knew about any works that have been, um, but I'm presuming it happened in the background. Deaccessioning is a thing that happens in museums. It's, you know, but it, not that it's like a rare thing, but it is often a notable thing. And it also can be quite a controversial thing. Um, so this news of the Whitney um, deaccessioning some paintings, um, aka selling them uh, to raise funds and make space for new acquisitions um, is still like fairly recent news. And so by the time this episode comes out, it, there may be have been some developments on this or like how this was um, interpreted by <laughs> various organizations, which we'll get to later. Um, but as it stands now, like this is we're just kind of like, OK, they've made this announcement that they're going to be selling these paintings. Um, but in the past, this has gone in many different kinds of ways like traditionally it's very strongly looked down upon um to sell paintings from museum holdings i i will say actually i just remember there is one po- a kind of experience i have with this that is outside of the ago context which was i was actually for a period in charge of organizing or figuring out what to do with the art collection that was owned by the hospital that I worked for. Um, Cause we were a really big, or we are, yeah, we were a really big hospital network. That's like the hospitals over 125 years old. And over its period of time, there has been lots of art donations and, um, or people who just somehow got a hold of art and some of it is actually well known by like famous Canadian artists so we can't just throw it in in the trash and even up until I left we didn't we couldn't figure out what to do and and it wasn't because there wasn't like policies and, and experts we could consult it was just people didn't understand how much work it is to figure out what to keep and what to not and we were gonna we were gonna hire um I think it was someone who was I forget their title but they were an expert in terms of like figuring out art collections like a collections manager we were gonna hire them but then we just couldn't because people making decisions were just like I don't understand why can't you just go through and see what we like and what we don't like and get rid of it and I'm just like oh my god (laughs) Um, and of course they were like okay we'll figure this out later because right now there is a pandemic going on and we need to save lives and who cares about these paintings <laughs> so wait so someone non-ironically was like just look at this painting do you want to keep it the way I just did as a joke well, seriously because they were like oh look we ju- we hired someone who has experience working in art galleries and she's knowledgeable about art like Betty why don't you go through these and figure out what to do with them and I'm like no I can't th- I can't make that decision <laughs> on the other thing was actually and there was real good reason to go through it sorry I'm going on tangent here because I just remembered this but the other reason was this was capital asset that the hospital owned and it actually wasn't on the books because again no one knows like how much is worth and or people didn't even realize it was worth money um until like I was like oh my god I think that's by like someone famous um so then they we also need to figure out what we want to keep to know like how much value we have so we can like write it into the books as a part of the hospital's assets. But again, people are like, what? <laughs> how does this work? <laughs> so anyway, it was, it, it was a whole thing. I, I hope they figure it out at some point, but I don't work there anymore. <laughs> so. Yeah. Well, I mean, this, this, the process of deciding what to sell from museums sounds hellish um i don't even have really anything like any insights into how different museums have decided like what are the pieces that they should sell because it's something that not only do you have to decide like within your organization um then like when you put the news out there um other people get really mad at you about it (laughs) and so you have to like be balanced you have to like be picking the right things and have the right reasons and all this stuff um and the the This controversy really started back in like the early 1970s um, when the Met sold a Rousseau and a Van Gogh painting um, to separate paintings. It wasn't like a weird collab. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Um, And they were paintings that were part of this big donation that came from the estate of a a 
donator. Um, and then they like sold those pieces from the donation and used the money to acquire a Velasquez portrait. And everyone was like, that sucks, boo. <laughs> um, and they were like, it seems like you violated the terms of the will and all this stuff. And uh, there was, the, the, I think the general conclusion that was drawn was that they were not um, transparent enough about the process of the deaccessioning. And so um, this this was like the first big controversy about it and really set the tone um, and uh, the idea of like, it is bad to deaccession things. But these days it is growing a little bit more uh, accepted um, and less just like automatically looked down upon, Um, especially when you look at something like the Whitney, um, where you talk about like part of the explicit purpose um, of the Whitney is that they are supposed to be like showing like living contemporary artists. If you want to be showing living artists, like you do have to be like making space for art of like new art because you know things get old over time <laughs> um, and th- that status changes <laughs> artists become not living at some point and um i just looked it up edward hopper died in 1967 so that was a while ago <laughs> i i do think that there's this interesting thing that's happened in art that i think that we as like an art world and general society are still grappling with where like modern art is like a particular era of art and then but like contemporary art has stretched past that so long but we still kind of think of like everything from like mid 20th century to now as being within the sort of like recent era of art which it is definitely like on the long time scale of that but that's still like 70 years worth of art which if you're one museum with limited resources and even limited space um that can become a big issue and you have to make a lot of decisions about what is the best use of those space and resources there is definitely like a weird dark side to the Whitney's mission uh, with regards to deaccessioning as well, um, because during the 70s and 80s, the museum director, his name is Thomas Armstrong, because the Whitney's dedicated to specifically American art, he was like, well, anyone who isn't like a legal permanent resident of the United States uh, is not actually an American artist, and so we shouldn't have their art. And he was like, mm, I don't know. These people don't have a passport or a green card, <laughs> so it sounds not legit to me. I'm doing a very funny voice because obviously this is a stupid idea. <laughs> yeah. um, and they literally, he was like, what if we deaccessioned everyone who like doesn't have the proper paperwork, including they <laughs> oh had like God. one of um, Kusama's works and they oh. were going to get rid of that, which is like, what? <laughs> wow. <laughs> good, good to know that. I mean, I, I'm, I'm sure that, or ho- hoping they're, policies have changed since then but if not good to know that as a person living in america but i am not technically having an american passport and it's possible i can't get my art into the whitney (laughs) but it's probably for other reasons but (laughs) yeah luckily we hit like 1990 and they were like never mind that was a bad idea (laughs) oh in, in the meantime though uh Overall, the process of deaccessioning is very widely scrutinized by the Association of Art Museum Directors, Um, and there's no, like, legal limitations on this. I mean, like, obviously, there's laws about, like, there's, like, tax law, you know, but nobody can stop a museum from selling its collection, but the Association of Art Museum Directors can sanction you if they feel like you made a poor decision or, like, didn't do deaccessioning properly and if you're sanctioned that means that like you're not going to be able to loan artworks with other museums you can't share resources you can't do these collaborative projects so you basically get totally cut off um from everyone who's a member which is like all the everyone that you'd everyone want to be doing that stuff with (laughs) yeah yeah yeah. um you get blacklisted basically um and then you can't do the work that you need to do to make uh your museum run as best as i could um and so that's something that obviously people want to avoid but the the specific thing is like um in the association for art of art museum directors the aamd (laughs) um (laughs) You are only allowed to deaccession works, to sell off works, and in order to use that money to 
acquire different works and new works. So like you have to have a, it has to be like a very well like communicated and well thought out reason that you are getting rid of these works and then you have to use that money to get different works like you can't use that money for anything else oh i see it can't be like we we need new carpet in our office um (laughs) we're gonna use that money to to renovate that uh yeah yeah (laughs) okay i see (laughs) yeah that makes sense uh, there has been a little bit of loosening of this um, since the pandemic um, because, one, they kind of, like, suspended the sanctioning for a little bit um, for some of the more strict things because they were like, hey, these museums need help. Um, <laughs> so uh, there was, like, so now, like, if a museum sold a, a painting and then they use that money to, like, do, like, better care of their collections basically like investing in um staff and other resources that you need to take good care of your collections um they were like okay i guess that's fine (laughs) since times are hard and we understand (laughs) that things are not easy um so there is like a little bit of softening of that these days you don't have to like strict that money does not strictly have to be used just to buy new art with so i guess do we know the reasons that they're getting rid of these pieces? I don't know. You might get to that at one point. I just, I'm curious. Interestingly, I did not see any specific justification for this piece. Um, it is, they are putting up eight for sale. Um, this is just the most sort of famous uh, one of the ones that they are putting up. Um, and while this is far from Hopper's most famous work or anything, like Hopper is a very prominent artist and he is like a, a very prominently displayed at the Whitney. Um, so it's it's pretty notable that they are selling one of his paintings in particular. I remember seeing a lot of Edward Hopper's when I was there. <laughs> they, they could use to lose a few. <laughs> yeah. Well, the, the quote that was given by the curator, um, Jane Panetta, was, we want to grow the collection. This is part of hitting that goal, and it's a goal we've had for a while, really since the museum moved to its current location in 2015. The permanent collection hang held following the Whitney's move to the Meatpacking District in 2015 um, America is hard to see was the catalyst that initiated the curators to look at the holdings new. Um, and so it's this, the, I, basically the, it seems like it comes down to like, we moved locations relatively recently and we've been trying to like figure out what we can get rid of <laughs> so that we can have more, uh, space for new stuff. And it is like that, cause that is, it's, it's sort of like, it works both ways, right? It's like, oh, Hopper is so iconic at the Whitney, but also like they have a bunch of Hopper and so they can afford to to sell one of them and maybe put a different artist in that space instead. They're still trying to pay off that new building, that Renzo Piano building that they um, they got. It's it's too, too much, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> Before I want to, I, I do want to have just sort of like a general conversation about this whole process and what you think of it but I do have one specific other thing to bring up before we get to that which was in 2020 uh, the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art um, tried like announced their intent to do some deaccessioning Uh, this is by director Christopher Bedford um, and they were like hey we're gonna sell a couple of these works that were made by white male artists I believe one of them was a Warhol um, and we're gonna do that and then we're gonna get some more contemporary works by women and people of color and we're going to boost some of our salaries because like you know it's covid and everything's horrible um and so we're going to like support our people um and people lost their minds (laughs) and they said no 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 (laughs) and so that ended up not happening okay um, because there was so much pushback against it but there's part of that's really interesting because the very first director of the moma um alfred barr actually mandated that any works over 50 years old should be sold so that the uh, MoMA can like keep acquiring works by living artists so you have all these like people from different museums especially like different contemporary art museums is this whole idea of w- shouldn't we just be like continuing to sell things so that we can get new things but also like if you're selling things they're not necessarily going to another museum where they're accessible to the public like usually they're not at this point like they're going into private collections they're going into these places um where they are being removed from uh the this like public 
cultural access. Um, and so that can be a huge issue, especially if you're not that I like need to stand on Warhol's behalf. <laughs> we like weirdly did that a lot in that one episode. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like whatever, Warhol's fine. He's not, his work is not hard to find, <laughs> yeah. but there is, I think that there is something to the idea of like works made by quite prominent artists are something that people do really want to go experience. And so like, just because they're like, old (laughs) that doesn't necessarily mean that that like they're they lose value in a contemporary art museum setting um not and no one's saying that but I think that that like there's different sides to this um and I do think that like there has to be a, a lots of things that are taken into consideration before you can make a decision like this. And it's really interesting to see how different museums over time have had shifting ways of thinking about it. I find it interesting that this, it's so hard for these contemporary art museums to get rid of these works because it does seem like if your goal is to display or um, hold collections of you know artists that are more or less living or or are working in recent decades or just basically trying to be up to date that is a i would say that's a really good reason to sell a lot of your older paintings like it shouldn't be this controversial i can see it if you're you know like you know museum of fine arts where you have a lot of really old stuff but like you having old stuff is a part of your brand then I feel like then it would be really hard to get rid of anything <laughs> and maybe maybe they yeah. don't and I don't know and that's that was the other thing I'm like the AGO technically has collections of works from like all times in history and they can't use the excuse of well we're trying to be up and current and up to date and it's like well that's not really what you have to do yeah your contemporary galleries should but you can then put this in the old stuff part so I you would think that it would be easier for these contemporary art museums to deaccession and but if it's so hard for them to do it I can imagine just how much more difficult when you're not contemporary. Yeah, th- it's interesting like everything I was reading about this really had this focus on contemporary art museums because I guess it's probably just less of an issue if you're if you're dedicated to collecting like Monet <laughs> There's only so much of that out there. What are you going to do? Sell one and get a different one? Like, it's just, it's just, you're not, like, getting contemporary, like, art from older eras because definitionally Mm -hmm. they do not exist. (laughs) When I first started reading all about this, I felt like, oh, well, of, of course museums should be able to sell works and get new works and stuff because, I mean, I work in a library, um, that is, (laughs) <laughs> and, and I work specifically like in a library that that acquires like expensive things like I don't know <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm trying to say like um it's not just like a, a public circulation library mm-hmm. it's like a, a research library and there's there's works that are coming in there that have like specific and unique value mm-hmm. um and I don't think there's any basically any deaccessioning going on or <laughs> oh, wow. very very little and let me tell you, it causes problems. You run out of space. Yeah. You do not have enough people to, like, deal with the things that you have. Like, and it, it really can be a lot of problems in these cultural heritage institutions. And so I totally get it. But then I, the more I was thinking about it, that I was like, oh, but also we, I mean, we've talked so much in the past about, like, the relationship between the, the mega rich and the art world. Um, and there's this quote from Eric Neal of the Christ Museum of Art said if you want to flip paintings there are other types of institutions where you can do that and they are called commercial galleries <laughs> and I was like oh yeah because I mean that, like I said before you know you these when they're available in museums like even if the museum is expensive like it is available to be seen by the public and you know a millionaire snatches that up and then it's hanging in his living room you can't do anything about that and now suddenly that piece is not available for people to see anymore and just like Ooh. Yeah, I was actually going to ask about deaccession and whether you guys do that at the library because I happen to know a bunch of librarians. Um, and uh, and I actually, um, for a period of time when I worked at the school board, I did some renovations to school libraries and I worked with a lot of um, high school and elementary school librarians. And they, so I guess the other part of learning about 
a little bit about deaccessioning was with books because they definitely had to get rid of some stuff because when we were renovating some of these schools, there's just absolutely no space. And we were like, yeah, this like half of this has to go. And they did go through it. But I guess with books, at least you can say, okay, this is a copy. This is a duplicate. We don't need 14 like um, Harry Potters or something. I don't know. Um, but then I guess, yeah, like it's it's also difficult to make a decision if it's not a duplicate, then it's like, what do you decide is should be in a school library and should it? And again, I have no idea how they made those decisions, but I do know that they did have to make them. And I would say it's true. Like you just like you just run out of room. And again, when I'm when we're designing for whether it's offices or libraries or museums, it is funny how one of the like biggest challenges is the storage room like nobody nobody ever talks about it and when we when you publish like in designs in magazines no one shows you the storage room but that in some cases we spent a lot of time just figuring out like okay how do we make enough space for them to store all their stuff and then when you go to them and say hey you need to get rid of stuff they they freak out so um it definitely isn't an easy problem to solve just think about how hard it is to get rid of stuff in your own house (laughs) and then imagine that thing is actually worth millions of dollars (laughs) and you could get rid of it and maybe get other stuff that might might even be better for your particular purposes but if you do that someone might get really mad at you um (laughs) and now it's like oh okay is it better to get rid of this and get new things or is it better to keep this because this it it's just like I do not envy the people that have to make these decisions I guess is my end of it because yeah I, I came into this thinking that I had an opinion about it and then the more I read that I was like ooh, I don't know if I have an opinion about this I feel like it's just such a case-by-case basis thing and of course it has to happen like decessioning has to happen you always have to be getting rid of things and also this is not even the same thing but when i see people out there getting mad at libraries for weeding which is what you were just talking mm-hmm. about we're like you just it's it is still deaccessioning but i feel like the, the word deaccessioning like implies um like selling or like putting into different institutions weeding means garbage yeah, it is garbage you put it in the garbage every couple the months trash. people on the internet rediscover that libraries have to weed and throw away slash recycle books <laughs> and they lose their goddamn mind stop getting mad at libraries it's part of the process yeah. everyone bought 50 copies of 50 shades of gray <laughs> and now no one's reading it you have to get rid of them <laughs> okay that's just a no tangent. you absolutely cannot get rid of 50 shades of gray that is the- <laughs> culturally <laughs> significant it has to be all kept <laughs> the science textbooks are out of date they have to get rid of them no one they're not useful anymore <laughs> yeah exactly um i was just gonna say yeah like these do definitely are difficult decisions and it, they have to be treated on a case-by-case basis but i guess like personally as someone who really does like to get rid of stuff because I really don't like you know clutter um I'm probably more so on the side of yeah let's get rid of stuff let's go through and look at what we don't need anymore whether it's books or paintings and there's gonna have to be some tough decisions and I constantly have to have these conversations with clients, um, again, when we're designing their space, to be like, no, your storage room can't be 75% of your space because, like, that's crazy. So <laughs> you, you're going to have to, like, push them to make these hard decisions. And I, I, now I'm curious about some of the stuff actually at the AGO and I still know some people who work there so maybe I'll like ask them because like for instance there is in the Canadian art collection there are I don't even know how many there must be like a million paintings by this artist named Cornelius Kriegoff and it was because it came through in a donation and this person happens to have owned like 
the entire collection of this guy's paintings for some reason or or something like that. And there are just so many that you you couldn't display all of the Kriegovs. The entire AGO would become the Cornelius Kriegov art gallery. So I'm in my head, I'm like, they should probably get rid of them. And maybe they have, maybe they haven't. I don't know. I'm sure if they do, someone will freak out because there's going to be a fan out there of Kriegov who's, who just wouldn't be okay with it. But then my argument would be, well, you're not going to see all of these anyway because there's just too many. Like, we just get, get rid of like 90% and then we'll still have like 100. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like, you know, we're both in favor of deaccessioning happening out there in the world. And I don't want to be the one to figure out what to do it with. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, thanks so much for uh, talking with me about this today. Um, this was a just a fun little light topic um, to get into. I wonder if anyone out there has worked in a museum that was part of this process um, and what that looked like. Because I'm, I'm very curious of how the logistics of this actually go. Yeah, me too. Yeah, it is very interesting. And, and again, it, it seems like such a simple process at first like deaccessioning getting rid of stuff throwing in the trash (laughs) how hard could it be (laughs) but it's a lot more complicated well if you would like to see the links to everything that we talked about today that'll be at relay.fm slash pictorial Um, you can also find us on twitter or instagram at pictorial pod and i am also on instagram at quinsta rose and I am on Twitter and Instagram as Articulations V, and I'm also on YouTube as Articulations. And speaking of YouTube, we have a YouTube channel for pictorial podcasts where we upload some of our older episodes in video version. And by the time you get to this one, there might not be much to see except a picture of Edward Hopper's painting and a trash can, maybe. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Thanks for listening, art enthusiasts. 